So what I want to talk to you about is <clears throat> the Islamic Golden Age. This is not talked about in many places. It's not talked about in the masajids. It's not talked about in the school because what this period is, is a time when Islam was on the top, okay? When Islam left Medina, he went to other parts of the, of the, of the world. He went over to, the, to West Africa, okay? And from Africa, it, it spread in throughout different places. So Islam was on the top. <clears throat> the European will, will refer to this age as the age of darkness. I don't know if you have ever heard of that, that, um, that, that phrase, but they consider this years of the Islamic golden age as the years of darkness. So yes, they were in darkness, but it did not mean that the rest of the world was in darkness also, okay? Because there were things happening. Well, let me get over to the next slide. And this is not a lecture, brothers. I'm your friend, okay? I'm your brother, and we'll have a discussion, okay? We'll have a discussion. So if you have questions, we will, when we finish the, the presentation, we'll have ans you know, time for discussion, you know, what are your thoughts, and you know, ask questions if you, something is not clear. So what I've used, I've used a book, it's called A Thousand and One Invention, okay? But this book here was put together by a professor in England. He's from, uh, he's actually he's from Iraq, okay? And um, one, the, one, one event, uh, a professor from Oxford University called him and said, look, I want you to look into the thousand years of, uh, of Islamic, uh, Islamic breakthroughs. So he asked the professor, what was that breakthrough? I mean, he never heard of it. He said, of course he's not going to hear about it because it's not going to be taught in the schools. But he said, you are from Iraq. He said, yes. He said, you have a very long history. Okay, go in. I wanted to look into it. So eventually he took on the venture and eventually he got other Muslim professors to come in. And they went in and they eventually wrote, they compiled this book. It's called A Thousand and One Invention. Um, and it has to do with what Muslims have contributed towards civilization and how it affects us in today's world, okay? And you will be surprised at the amount of things that affects us that the Muslim has put forward. So we go with the introduction. The Islamic, um, Islamic uh, Golden Age started from the, from the 6th to the 13th century. So you know about the 6th century? What took place in the 6th century was the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu okay? So the golden age of the Muslim civilization uh, stretched from the Arabian Peninsula, which is considered Saudi Arabia and uh, our neighboring country, Bahrain, and these countries. And it went to northwest of, and the northeast of Africa, so the entire top portion of Africa, from the west of Africa to the east of Africa. Okay, <clears throat> and then it also spread into Spain, the southern part of Spain. Um, there were men and women from different faiths. So what would happen? This empire compiled of people of different faith. Okay, and they would come together, and they would share the knowledge among each other. Okay, so that's what took place in that period of time. Uh, this period was built on knowledge taken from the ancient civilization. So you had a civilization before, you had the Greeks, okay, you had the Persian, you had the Babylonians. They all had their own scholars, they had their own science, the scientists. But, um, but we're going to go more into what a scientist is. Um, there were people from different parts of the world, being that the empire was so extended, it extended from the Arabian Peninsula into Spain, then it went over to Persia, then it went to e into Asia, where then it went to, to India, so it spread throughout the entire globe on that middle section. <clears throat> and like I said, the Golden Age took place during the so-called Dark Ages of the Europeans. 
Uh, this is the this is the breakdown of the years. So you see from 570 to 632, okay, that was the lifespan of the Prophet. Okay. So starting from 632 to 661 was the was the four caliphs. Then from 670, 661, 670, you had different dynasty will take over. So the capital had moved from Medina. Right? The capital had left Medina and he went to different different places. So we'll see the areas that the capital moved to. You had the Abbasid, you had the Umayyad, and then eventually in 1258, the Mongolians invaded the Muslims and destroyed what we now call when the destroy of the Islamic uh, Islamic Golden Age. So 1258 when everything came to a cease and it stopped. <coughs> This is a break. This show. This map shows you the Islam, uh, the, the the Islamic world as it went to the different caliphates. So deep orange or the deep uh, color in the bottom where the Arabian Peninsula is, that was the time of the Rasulullah Okay, and then we can see the different colors as it keep expanding on the different caliphs. All right, and on the last of it, you see from Spain, which is right over here. I'll put the cursor. Um, I don't know if you can see it. But Spain is on the top where it says Toledo and Cordoba. So Cordoba is where the capital had moved to. Okay? <clears throat> and we went, we've extended all the way. Okay, here it is, right here. So this is all of the Asia, uh, these are all the Persian Peninsula. It went into Asia, into Hong Kong, into China, into India. So that was the empire. Eventually, this is what the empire had looked like. Okay, this is how the, how the empire had looked like. Now, one of the most important things we have to discuss here is if the Islamic empire was this vast, how did it come to a point where everything was lost? You know, how did the Muslim lose control of this? You got to remember now. It was not only Muslim living in these areas. There were a lot of non-Muslims, okay? But they were living under Islamic rules, right? A man could have traveled from China all the way to Spain, okay? And didn't have to fear that he was going to get robbed or his goods wasn't going to get stolen, okay? He would have been he able to travel safely and without a visa or without any documentation. Once he was within the the, the Muslim the Muslim control area, okay, and it strived, but the one thing that the Muslim did not do and they did not have, they didn't have unity among themselves, and we are in that situation today, okay. The problem that we have today is called the Andalusian syndrome, that where the dynasty were fighting against each other, brothers were fighting against brothers. Fathers against sons, sons against parents, brothers were, they were sabotaging and they were compiling, you know, cahooting with the enemies to destroy their own family. And we are seeing that, or we are living it, we're not seeing it, we're living it. There's disunity among the Muslims, okay? And this is why, one of the main reasons, when the Mongolians came to the Muslims and were slaughtering them, they started from Asia, they were slaughtering the Muslims. Okay, and when they would ask them, Who are you people? Okay, the Mongolians say to them that we are your punishment from your God. Okay, your God sent us to punish you. So they slaughter them. This, this period here, when the Muslims went into these lands, okay, they did not go there and kill and take over. When they went to these lands, okay, they built, they didn't destroy, they built and enhanced what was there. They actually made it better than what they founded. And this is what Muslims are supposed to do. When we go to places, when we go to areas, when we, go to, when we move into areas and we, and we fit ourselves in, we should make that place better than what we founded, you know. We should not make it worse. <clears throat> So this is what the, this is how they were able to conquer it and get to get many of these places. Now this this graph here will show you 
what should have been taught in school and what has not been taught in school. So you have the you have all the ancient the ancient uh, period. Then you have the Dark Ages, so 600 to 1300 about there, about thousand years. And this is the period that has not been taught in school because they don't want you to know what what took place in here. Okay, and then from there, from the Muslim uh, Islamic Golden Age, then it took us into the Renaissance period. From the Renaissance period, it took us into the Industrial period. Now, let me explain what the different periods are. Now, the Renaissance, okay, what they did was they took the books that was written by the Muslims and they translated those books into Latin, okay? Because the majority of the European continent were speaking Latin. And they took the knowledge, they draw the knowledge out of those books, okay? And that paved the way for the industrial period. Now the industrial period is when a lot of machineries was invented. Okay? Now today, what they will show you is that Galileo and Da Vinci were the ones who designed these machines. They were the ones who came up with the idea of certain machines, right? That's what the that's what they will teach you in school. But eventually the truth cannot the truth can only be hidden so long you know eventually it will come out so without this period here this wouldn't have happened then you wouldn't have had the industrial okay and now we are at the modern civilization okay so this one needs to be taught in school that golden age or what they refer to as the dark ages the abbasid caliphate last from 750 to 1258 the, that was the that was the longest most influential islamic dynasty actually they were the last of the dynasty to survive okay it was the largest empire in the world they had contact with distant neighbor such as chinese indians in the east the byzantine in the west allowing it to adopt and synchronize idea of their cultures so what it is was Islam opened the platform, you know, it opened, opened up the road for all these other cultures to come in and they can learn from each other, okay? <clears throat> the fifth caliphate of the Abbasid dynasty, his name was Harun al-Rashid. He started, well, look at that, 786, okay? 786 to 809. And the remembrance as one of the history greatest Train to art and science. Now, our Deen, our, our Quran, or the Quran is not a book of science, it's a book of signs, right? And we're going to see later on in the, in the presentation what, how these signs were important. Baghdad in Iraq became the world's most important center for science, psychology, medicine, and education. So, what happened in Baghdad was Baghdad became became the capital of the empire. Okay? It became the capital of the empire. <clears throat> the successor of, of Harun al Rashid was his son al Mamun, and he was from 813 to 833. He supported artists, scientists, and scholars. Al Mamun found the Bait al Hikmah. Has anyone ever heard of the Bait al Hikmah? No? So this is the house, like I, like I just said. This was a, uni a university in Baghdad, in Baghdad where all the scholars used to converge. Okay? So you had Jewish, you had the Muslims, you had the Chinese, you had the Indians. You had everyone used to come to this, this, this university there, this house, and they used to exchange ideas. They used to exchange their knowledge. Um, the House of Wisdom was hosted by Muslims and non-Muslim scholars who sought to translate and gather cumulative knowledge of human history in one place. Now, this period here is important also because they call this period the translation period. So, this, this uh, dynasty, he used to pay anyone that would translate the books, the biggest books from the Greeks and the Babylonians and the different cultures they would be paid the amount in gold as the book was weighed. 
So they were paid very, very vast amount of money, right? What they had to do was they had to translate those languages into Arabic, right? And then they would draw out of those books different knowledge, different breakthroughs. Then what they would do, they would take these knowledge that they draw from that book and work in it and enhance it, make it better, okay? And we'll see that, that what they have done was phenomenal how it affects us in these years. The Islamic Golden Age ceased to exist in the invasion of the Mongolians in 1258. Now, what caused this period and what was the motivation that drove this period into existence? You know, and we can we can sit down, we can you know think to ourselves, um, what drove this period? Okay. And what drove this period was the first word that was revealed to the Prophet. Okay? In Surah Allah, Iqra. Okay. When that word was revealed to the Prophet, he immediately became a student of knowledge. Okay? He had to learn how to read. He had to learn how to recite, how to memorize. Jibreel Ali Salam would sit with him, would repeat, would repeat it, repeat it three times, he will he will repeat it or repeat it, he will memorize it. Okay. So when this word was revealed to the Prophet, okay. It opened up the world to knowledge, okay? Because this Quran is the only book that call people to knowledge, call people to study, okay? It called the people to come out and read. Not only that, Islam has given great importance to the process of seeking knowledge. And it's in that same surah. If you look at the first five verses um, in the Quran, uh, we can see that the word Iqra repeated two times. The word Qalam is mentioned once. And the word Teach was repeated thrice. Okay? So you give a process of how, how we should seek the knowledge. Islam make a, a religious duty upon every Muslim to seek knowledge. Okay? With the intention of what? The benefit oneself and humanity. Okay, when we seek knowledge, when we acquire knowledge, it should not make one one person or make us um, arrogant, or should make us feel that we're on top. You know, actually, knowledge. When people acquire knowledge, it should actually humble them and bring them down to a lower, lower, you know, lower state. It should not make them feel too proud. All right. <clears throat> And then Allah said in the Quran, Allah will exalt those who believe among you and those who have granted knowledge to high ranks. The Prophet said, Who whoever follow a path in pursuit of knowledge, Allah will make his way easy to Jannah. Inshallah. Islam called upon men of understanding to look into the signs of Allah and ponder upon them. For in them are benefits for mankind. So here now the Quran came. Okay. And the Quran came from many people of different level of understanding. Okay. It came for even the Bedouin in the desert. Okay. It came for the layman men. But also the Quran has the signs for men who think and men who understand. Who would look upon things, the signs, and will ponder on them and will derive from them benefits within themselves. And this is the this one here, this uh, this ayat here talked about about calling upon men of intellect, you know. And in the signs, when the rain falls, then the rain brings nourishment to the ground, and then you're able to nourish you. So, what what this have done was, it has actually called upon all of us to become a scientist, okay? Because scientists, when they want to when they want to look at something, first they take it. They observe it for a period of time. They think about it. Okay. They come up with a hypotenuse, a hypotenuse. And then they, what they do was they took some time and they look upon it. And then they derive the benefit out of that. Okay. And the Quran called upon us to do that. Okay. Not all of us going to be, not all of us going to understand the Quran on the same level. Okay. That's why the Quran is so beautiful that it came for everyone with different level of understanding. I don't know. Any question? Am I going too fast? 
Okay. We'll continue. Now, one thing I wanted, I wanted, I want to mention to you. Now, you know, in school we learn that the solar system, that um, the sun is stationary, and the, all the the world or the earth and every the planets are going around the sun. This is what we taught in school, right? But the Quran have never mentioned that. The Quran in Surah Rahman mentioned that the sun is running to a destination unknown to it, right? So the Quran actually tells us that the sun is what's moving, okay? Now he never mentioned about the earth moving, he never mentioned about the other bodies moving. They all have their own orbit, they don't collide with each other because of the mercy of Allah. This is the plan of Allah. But the, the Quran in Surah Rahman said that the sun is running to a destination unknown to it. Okay? Now, people have come up with different, uh, different ideas how the solar system is probably moving. Now, uh, we all know that when we looked at the solar, they, they showed the sun there and all the planets are going around, right? But if the Quran said that the sun is moving, that means that if the sun is moving to a, to a, a path, that means it's moving and the, and the planets are moving behind it and they're moving. Okay? This is what... Now, that question was asked to a scholar in Saudi Arabia. And he said, he, I don't understand why the West keep teaching that the planet moves around the sun when the Quran says that the sun is moving to its destination. So everything is moving. You know, everything is moving to a destination that they don't know where they're going. Now, here is a scientist of the late, what do you call the late century, okay? <clears throat> Isaac Newton. And he had made a statement and said, If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulder of giants. Okay? Now, who are these giants that he's speaking about? Remember? See, he's coming in and the year in the 17th century. All of this happened in the 6th centuries and, and, and coming forward. But he came up with a lot of breakthroughs and everyone thinks that he is the one who came with these breakthroughs. Now let's start now, with, let me go into some of the, um, some of the, the things that, that I felt I took, I took from my side, I felt was important, that it affects us up, up to now. Like the first toothbrush that was brought together, that was brought to us. <clears throat> it was a miswak. And today, miswak has, is becoming a big effect on, on the Western world because they found the benefit of the miswak. Okay? It kills germs, it freshens your breath, it cleans the enamel of your teeth, it keeps it white. Okay? <clears throat> so this was brought out first to, to and introduced to mankind. coffee today you will hear the Italians say that we have the best cup of coffee or the, uh, the English will say we have the best and the Americans will say we have the best cup okay so there was a man in Ethiopia okay he was grazing his animals and he found that when they were eating of certain beans okay the animal became more livelier they were running around more and what he did was he took the beans or that particular bean and he put it he boiled it and he drank it now over the years by the 15th century it had it had arrived in Mecca and it had arrived in Turkey by this time here the Empire was flourished right in the year 1650 it was brought to England by a Turkish man named Asqua Rosé who opened up the first coffee house in England and, and you see the name is in Lombard in the city of London. Now here is the, here is the picture of the house. It's actually still there. Okay. Now look at that. It's the year 1650. So when you drink the cup of coffee, it didn't come from the Italians and it didn't come from the English or the Americans. Okay. Came from the Muslims. Um, shampoo. So we know that Islam calls for cleanliness, right? Everything that we do has to deal with cleanliness. So washing and bathing are religious requirement of Muslims. The Arabs used to combine vegetable oil and sodium hydroxide and some scents like the tame oil to make it smell, you know, make it smell nice. And they would use that to wash themselves. 
Now look at this. In year 1759, the first shampoo bath house was opened in England. Okay, they didn't have they didn't have um, bath houses existence in those days in England. Okay, as a matter of fact, one of the things that was astounding was in the capital when the capital was in court it was in Cordoba, Spain. They used to pave their roads with bricks. Okay, the Queen of England had visited that capital, and when she went there, she saw the roads were paved with bricks. But not only that, they also had a risen sidewalk where people would walk. Okay, in England, they had dirt. They had no roads. Okay, so that's how advanced the Muslims was. They didn't stop there because of the universities that they had. Kings and queens used to send their children to that university in Cort in Cordoba to get knowledge. Okay, they used to send their children there to get to get acquired knowledge. So, as you can see, that in 1759 was when the first bathhouse got into England. Another thing that the Muslims had in those days that didn't was didn't exist in Europe was windmills. And windmills was used to grind grains for irrigation. Um, <clears throat> they had different uh, different methods of uh, making the windmills. It was 500 years before the first windmill was seen in Europe. Okay, so they already had windmills abundantly throughout the Muslim Empire. Another thing that brought that brought was the fountain pen. Now we know the English might say that we brought fountain pen to to, to human, right? But in the year 1953, fountain pen was invented for the Sultan of Egypt. Okay, it held ink, it held ink in the reservoir, and it used uh, it was it fed ink to the pen uh, by gravitational pull. Here's another breakthrough that we had that the Muslim invented was the checks. Now the modern check comes from the Arabic word sack. Now this check here, if someone was dealing business in, in China and he lives in Spain, if he had to carry the gold with him, it would be an amount of, a uh, humongous amount of gold that he would have to carry, right? So what they would do, they would write, write a promissory note that so-and-so is owed this amount of uh, this amount of gold okay so he will take that note back to Spain where he's from go to the bank or they had a banking system there he would give them that and then they will give him the gold that was written on the note okay this is what we have today as a check right so alleviate any kind of problems for him of carrying that or risk getting robbed or risk getting it stolen <clears throat> In the ninth century, a Muslim businessman could have cashed a check in China and draw his bank, draw it in on his bank in Baghdad. So we see where where these inventions are making, how it's benefiting us now. Now, I'll explain. This is the, it's called a three-course meal. But um, Ali ibn Nafi came from Iraq to Cordoba in ninth century. He brought with him the concept of the three-course meal. Now, let me explain what a three-course meal is. Um, it's like during Ramadan, right? <clears throat> Ramadan, we have the iftar, right? Dates and the water. We go to pray. After we finish praying, we go and we have a dinner, right? After the tarawih, maybe we might have some ice cream, okay? So this is basically what a three-course meal is, okay? First, they will bring a bowl of soup, okay? When you finish with that, then you will have the main course. And after the main course, whether it's fish or meat or whatever you're eating, then they will bring some dessert for you, all right? Whether ice cream, coffee, or nuts or fruits or whatever the case is. So that's what a three-course meal is. Now, this here, this concept here, the Western world say that we're the one who brought about this concept. Okay, but when you go to when you go to a, 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 a typical Arab home, okay, to sit down, this is how they will bring the meal to you. Okay, they'll give you some soup, 
or if they don't have soup then they'll give you some salad okay you will have the salad then you'll go into the main course and after which you will have some coffee or you will have some fruit or some ice cream to go to you know to digest so this was uh, and it's still existing now okay very important year to remember 711 to 1492 okay what took place in this area here the Muslims from North Africa mainly Morocco Tunisia they crossed the, the Mediterranean Sea okay now <clears throat> the Mediterranean Sea it would consider something like how Corinthian River is okay so imagine we are in Africa here across the across where Suriname is would be Spain okay it wasn't much of a distance so what the Muslim did was they cross that Mediterranean Sea into Spain okay now <clears throat> what one of the things that the that the caliph or the emir of that time did was he said to them that we're going we're going to conquer and we're not returning so what he come what he what he commanded them to do was destroy the ships okay because it was only going forward it was no going back and they went into spain and when they went into spain there was there were some civilization there it was called the visigoth they were not um they were not a civilized people they were uncivilized like barbaric people they destroyed they killed um they had no sort of clothing they would wear like um animal skins or whatever it is that they could find to just cover themselves right they were very like dirty you know in sort of hygienic uh, they didn't have a hygienic kind of program with them so the muslim went in there but when they went there they didn't destroy what they had okay what they did was they built they enhanced the place okay <clears throat> under their under the muslim civilization they introduced many fa uh, facility under under their command they had libraries they had over 400 libraries in court in uh, in southern spain okay they had schools they built schools they had public bathrooms okay literature was was uh, big poetry was big and what they did was the last abbasid khalifa or the last abbasid em, em, amir they built he had built a palace it's called the alhambra palace okay when the spanish took over spain okay in 1492 they didn't destroy this palace you know why and this palace was uh, was like heaven in their eyes for them what they saw in this place was the beauty of how this place was was designed and how it was built the alhambra palace have its own irrigation system okay it doesn't need an irrigation system from anything when the water came in there it captured the water and it watered the entire garden it was considered the greenest part of spain okay um the columns with the domes, with the with the sill, the floors, everything was proportioned to each other. Okay, so they saw the beauty in this place, so they didn't destroy it; they kept it. Okay, so this is one example of how they couldn't escape from the from the Muslims. That is, it's there; you can go. Anyone that go, they can go in there and they can see it. Okay, actually, when they were running the last Amir out of there, and he stood on the mountain they said that he turned around and he looked at the palace and he cried right and his mother was with him and his mother said to him why are you crying when you couldn't stand as a man to, de to defend it okay now you understand what happened here they have already fought against each other all the dynasty was fighting against each other okay they had no time to build an army to, de to defend themselves all they had all they paid attention to was academics poetry gaining acquiring fighting you know and and they, they lost that they lost it this and the, the good the the bad thing about it was the spanish saw the weaknesses in them so what they did was they saw the weakness and they worked on that weakness and they put that wedge between the two of them and they split them apart and then they went into them so today that's happening to us 
we were in that situation, okay? Because the enemy of Islam sees the weakness in the Muslims, okay? They say, you know what? They are very weak. They don't stand with each other. The disunity among themselves. They're fighting among themselves, okay? This is, our, this is their weaknesses. So we're going to work on that weakness. Until we can get up and open our eyes and see what's happening and come together as unity and make, you know, bring that bond back together, we will always be stepped on. They're always going to step on us, okay? We're always going to be considered cheap in their eyes, okay? This is why our Muslim brothers and sisters throughout the world is going through these kind of atrocities because they know that we are weak within ourselves until the time will come when we will open our eyes and become one again and be you know be united so inshallah so let's go into another breakthrough that came that affects us today so you have the scientist his name was abu musa jabbar ibn hayyan okay a polymath is a person who is specialized in many different areas of uh, studies. Like he's a he's a mathematician. He can be an astronomer. He can be a chemist. You know. So a polymath is someone who is like that. You know. They they, they study many different areas. So he was the first one that came about with distillation. Okay. <clears throat> so we have chemistry today. They consider him the father of chemistry. Okay. So. That was Ibn Hayyan in his years. They took his books, they translated into, into Latin, they took his knowledge. Very, very important. Muhammad ibn Musa al Qarawismi. He is from Iraq. He was born in Iraq. Okay? Now, Qarawismi was living in the time when Bayt al Hikmah in, in uh, Baghdad was flourishing. There were breakthroughs all over. Now, I looked at this here, and I, 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 you know, I'm, I said to myself, you know, I'm very proud to be a Muslim first, okay, but then also I'm from, I'm my pair, my grandparents, or my great grandparents came from India, right? So I also look at this here, and I also feel proud about it. You know why? Because Al Khwarizmi was there in Bayt al Hikmah. The Chinese would come, the Indians will come, okay. They used to use, back in those days, um, Roman numerals as their numbering system, right? But the Hindus, when they came, they had some symbols, okay? Like the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they also had the zero, okay? But what, what al Khwarizmi did was, he took the number system from them, all right? And he played around with it, and the zero which had no value to the Hindus, he gave the zero a he gave the zero a purpose. So with the zero, what he did was he gave the zero the different tens and the numbers. You have the ten, you want to have the you have the one hundred, the thousand, and ten thousand, right? Being that he did that, you can write a number unlimited number. Okay? So the zero, he give it a decimal point or a decimal, a decimal place, right? <clears throat> Not only that, the zeros and the ones became very important when they were designing the computers. Because the zeros and ones became the binary language of the computers. Without the zeros and the ones, the computer would not have a language, right? And um, <clears throat> binary code is a code that they use during the wartime. Okay, when they would send messages to their to their counterparts, okay, the binary it would go zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Okay, zero was blocked like a like a blank. Then you have the one. So if you had like a like you, the binary code will go da 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 da. Okay, each dot or dot dot right means a zero or a one. And when you combine those numbers. They had people who would read the binary code they would define they would come out with a word okay so that 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 will mean a word okay that's how they would, they would read the binary code so the computer does that also your phone okay so when you pick up your phone today and you go into into google search right google search every character on google search or every character on your phone or your computer is represented by a zero or a one 
That's the language of the computer. So that's how important that came about. So because it came from the Indians, al Khwarizmi said that you refer to this number system as the Hindu numeric system. Okay? When the <clears throat> when they took the book that he wrote and translated it into, into Latin, they refer to the number as we know today is called the Arabic numeral system. Okay? But he referred to it as the Hindu numeric system. Now, you see the bottom there, right here? Where the additions and the subtractions are and everything? <clears throat> when they translated that, that book, okay, the calculation how the Arabs used to write and did their, their calculation was from the right to the left. Okay? Western world read from the left to the right. Okay? But because they didn't know how to do the calculation any other way, it was left the way it was. So we're always going to be working addition, subtraction, multiplication. You're always going to be doing it from the right to the left. Okay? That made me very nice and very proud when I went to school. You know, when I saw this, I said, SubhanAllah. You know, they tried to hide everything from us and from the world. But they couldn't do it any different way. They had to stay with the way it was done. You know? And that's the way they saw it. Now, one of the things that they did to him was they translated his name from the Muhammad Musa ibn Karawizmi to al -Qaridim. Okay? Why they did that to him? That statue actually is in Europe. They did that to him because al Karawizmi, he came about with what we call the equation today. Okay? You know, we went to school, we um, we always looking for the Y factor, okay? We're always looking for the X factor or the Y factor. Y always equal to something or X equal to something, right? So he would come out with the equation form in words form, okay? He didn't have the numbers to do it in numbers like we know it today. So he would write his out first, what the problem was, and then he would write out the competition or how to solve the problem. Why is this important? The word algorithm is what the computer uses today, right? When they want a computer to solve a certain problem, right? They have to write the program to go with that, to go with that, that problem that you want to fix. So first, what they'll, they'll outline the, the, what you're trying to do. And then they'll also write the program to solve the problem. So when we go into Google and we type in whatever we're typing in to look for something, Right? The algorithm of Google is, hey, I'm looking for this name, right? And the algorithm to find it is written in there how to find that, that name that you're looking for. So that's how important that became, okay? So when the, when the Western are fighting you and they're bringing their computers and they're looking in their computers, but they're fighting you, right? They're fighting you with a, with a, with a, with a computer that was given to them from the Muslims. It stems from the Muslims. Okay? So you see how important it is that we know our history? Not only the, the, the Islamic history or the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu right? But also, what, what did the Muslims do? I mean, did we just sit down? You know, something came to us. The Quran came to, the, came to those people. They didn't just take it and sat and just didn't do anything about it. The Quran called for a direction. Okay, it always called upon direction because why it always called upon direction towards the Qibla, right? So there were scientists working towards how to find the direction. We're in Iraq, we're in Uzbekistan, we're in India, we're in this place and that place. How do we find the direction to this place? So there were scientists always calculating how to find direction. The Quran all called for measurements, right? <clears throat> Big on measurements. How do we calculate measurements? We work there in the market. They're dealing with, uh, with business people from all over the world, right? So they had to come up with calculation for measurements, right? Inheritance. How do you calculate inheritance? So you see, these people did not take this knowledge and sat upon it. They worked on it and they, they enhanced it and they brought it out. So these were the signs that was in the Quran that they took the knowledge out of it and they benefit from it. Now, <clears throat> remember the guys in Europe, they're running around, okay? Now they're starting to come out. You know, they're coming out of the dark ages. 
and you have these books they are all in Arabic but you see the flourishing of these people how they were flourishing there's something good in what they were doing so this this uh, this algorithm came very very handy to us now that this is what the computer uses <clears throat> now the guy who um who you would ask the, the western world or you will ask the italians who was the best mathematicians that they had in that time and his name would be leonardo Fabaducci. and he was the one that would travel to persia and would travel to morocco with his father at young age and he would see the, uh, the businessmen in the marketplace. They would do calculation with weights and money. And they would do the transaction. And he acquired the book, the al Khwarizmi book. And he translated it into Latin. And he gave the name of the numeric system, the Arabic Hindu. I'm sorry, he gave the name, the Arabic numeral system. And that name is up to on today's date. When you go to school, and you learn uh, going to mathematics, they will refer to the number system as the Arabic numeral system.